Not that I need to say this to you guys, but I'm going to say it anyway. The official stance on Cell 53, we're doing a lot of work with Planned Parenthood. Um, we do believe that murder is happening. But I want to state for the record, so that there will be no doubt about it, we do not condone in any way, shape, or form people using violence to um, end abortion. We believe abortion is wrong because abortion is killing image bearers of God. Those little babies are little image bearers of God. So you don't solve that problem by taking a gun and killing other image bearers of God. That's not the way it works. The scripture does say that the, the soldier does not bear the sword in vain. Right? The soldier. It's in the hands of the government. God has put the sword in the hands of the government. He has not put the sword in the hands of the church. What he's put in our hands is a cross. So we go to Planned Parenthood with crosses, with the gospel. We don't go to Planned Parenthood with guns. We don't kill people. We're the good guys. The bad guys kill people. So, I wanted to state unequivocally for the record that we are completely and totally against what is happening at Planned Parenthood right now in Colorado. We are not for violence to solve violence. Um, secondly, it's just bad strategy. We are already winning the, the social dialogue. People are hearing about what they're doing. They're hearing about selling body parts and all the rest of it. This is completely unnecessary on another, another angle. Thirdly, the scripture says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So it's not for us to take vengeance as angry as we may feel about what's happening there. So, just wanted to say that, that is the official stance of Cell 53, not that anybody was thinking otherwise, but it just needed to be said. Is there anything else to add on? And by the way, I, I don't think that they've actually confirmed that it was any pro-life person down no. there. So... We don't even know if it's actually connected with Planned Parenthood. Media is just jumping all over it in that sense. But, Good point. nonetheless, if it is a pro-life person, they're obviously not pro-life. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> so, they're, they're just confused and lost. So, pray for the shooter as well that he would repent. Um, so, no further ado, let's hear from the preaching of the word. Let's let the Holy Spirit convict our uh, souls. Hmm? I'm going to Do you want to pray for me, John? No, I, he just looked like he was going Do you want to come up and pray for me? <laughs> let's all lay hands. All right, let's pray. God, we just come before you. God, your holy throne, your set apart throne. God, to worship you. God, we, we desire to worship you through the preaching of the word. God, would your spirit just speak to our souls through the mouth of Andrew. God, would you keep his mind clear and focused upon you in this moment. God, would you direct his words and would his words pierce our soul through your spirit. God, that we would be moved to further righteousness. And even Andrew in this moment, would you move him to further righteousness through this word that you have put, on, put upon his heart. God, may all things be done well. And God, may you just be glorified in all of this as we set our minds upon you. In your holy Son's name, amen. Amen. So, uh, last week we started 1 Samuel. So, we're going to go from 1 Samuel chapter 1 all the way to 1 Samuel, I don't know. I think it's 25 chapters. All the way to the end. We're going to go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through 1 Samuel. Last week, we found the people of Israel in a really terrible situation. They had strayed away from God. They went into idolatry. They were worshiping false God. They were just horrible. Did you have a question? Okay. So, they were just in a terrible situation, the people of Israel. And we went through the period of the judges where it would, what would happen is they were in the land that God had promised them. They would rebel against God. God would allow their enemies to attack them. They would cry out because of the oppression. God would send a deliverer. They would get saved from that oppression. They would get comfortable again. And then the same thing would happen over and over again. First Samuel catches us in the middle of all that junk. Actually toward the tail end of it. And we talked about 1 Samuel is where the kingdom, the kingship, 
the king is going to be introduced. Everybody's heard of David and King David. First Samuel is a book that introduces uh, the kingdom to Israel. Now, what's interesting is we said this society is completely in shambles. We said this society sounds very much like our society, right? This is a society where people are going around killing each other, doing all types of craziness. One of the things that you heard over and over again in the book of Judges is that the people did whatever was right in their own eyes. So this is still happening. We find a family, this man Elkanah, with his two wives, Penina and Hannah. Penina has all these children and mocks Hannah because she is barren. She cannot have any children. And instead of uh, Elkanah leading his wife and leading him to, her to look to the Lord, he instead offers her uh, chicken and himself, everything other than God. And she's also in a culture where the high priest and the high priest's son are just these terrible people. There she goes, she goes to where God is and she starts praying and she's praying fervently but her lips, her lips are moving but no sound is coming out and the high priest doesn't even know that she's praying. He accuses her of being a drunk. He basically called her an alcoholic out in front of everybody. This is a woman that had everything stacked against her but she cried out to God and God answered her prayer and gave her a son. The question that we asked was, okay, what are you going to do now? Now that you have this child that you've been praying for your entire life, what are you going to do with him? And she was faithful to the vow that she made to God because she had told God, listen, if you give me this child, I will give him back to you when he's done the, the, the weaning stage, right? Very difficult thing to do. And this is what she does. What we're going to see, this book is named actually after this woman's son. The woman's son's name is Samuel, who this book is named after. And so this man, Samuel, actually changed the entire culture of Israel forever and actually is the reason all of us are sitting here today. This one lady. And we will see how that all connects later on. But one of the major things that we talked about was you had an entire culture in shambles. And God says, okay, it's time for me to change this culture I'm going to bring a king in here. How am I going to do it? What means am I going to use to change an entire culture? And what God does is he isolates one family. And out of that family, it's not the man, because he's not leading. It's actually the woman who steps up and does what she needs to do. Um, and now we're going to see the, the change of culture that she brought about because of one woman's faithfulness to God. And we challenged the brothers to say, hey, um, this is a good thing that this woman had such spiritual strength about her, but it was this horrible thing that, that her husband was not there for her. So we challenged the men to be men of God. We also challenged the women to be women of God. Right? And we're not going to take a... We're not going to use bad men as an excuse to be bad women. Can't do that. Or we're not going to use no men as an excuse to be a bad woman. Right? Well, we're going to be women of God with or without... Men, That's, that was the challenge, right? But as men, whether you're married or not, whether you're with a woman or not, we need to be men of God. Okay, now, now that Hannah has, has this child, what is she going to do? Let's start off. We're in second, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Now, well, let's, let's back up to verse 27 of chapter 1. So in verse 27, she speaks to the high priest and says, For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. So she takes her child and she gives him up to God. Now, now think this through. Now by this time he's about three or four or five years old-ish, right? He can, he can, he can kind of hear discussion. Imagine for a moment what that must have been like for Samuel. Here's your mother. All you know from the moment you were born is that your mother's taking care of you. I can imagine that Hannah was with him everywhere that he went because she knew she was going to have to give him up. You know, when I had my son, uh, my firstborn, so I had all these complications when I was a small child and the doctor told my mother that I would never have children. So when we got pregnant... 
uh, I was freaking out because I was convinced that something bad was going to happen. We we're going to lose the baby. Uh, but we didn't lose the baby. We had a child. Do you know that I wouldn't put that kid down for anything? So we got a video somewhere in our basement somewhere of when we first brought him home. And it was me. I was holding him. You know, we, you, we took him upstairs for our first nap after. And I was the one that was holding him. When we took him for his first shots, it was me. You know, they, they stuck him with a needle. He's crying his eyes out. And the, the doctor tried to give him to his mother. And I was like, ah, my, my baby. I love my son, right? So you can imagine Hannah probably, this, this boy probably didn't spend any time on the ground. She was always holding him because she knew she's going to have to give him away. So all this guy knows is that his mother adores him, loves him, holds him all the time. And here she is now giving him away to this priest, this strange man who she doesn't, he doesn't know. At minimum, you know, they go up there once a year. So here he is as a small child, and he's being given away. He's being given away to this man, right? And you think to yourself, man, what must that have been like? But you see, what do you think Hannah was saying to Samuel when they would have their little conversations by the bedside? You think Hannah was saying, yeah, you know, you're just some kid. You better believe that Hannah would have those discussions over and over again with him. I prayed for you. There's a reason you're on this planet, son. There's a reason that you're here. Now listen, I didn't have uh, the most enjoyable childhood uh, when I was growing up. Okay? I didn't. But here's the thing that both my mother and my father instilled in me. Because I had had all those complications when I was a baby... They would sit down and say to me, the reason you're here is because God is going to do something with you. Over and over and over again, I would hear that. Sometimes I was acting all crazy and being silly. My mom would be like, Cliff, because that's my name, it's Cliff. Uh. <laughs> She'd say, Cliff, the Lord did not do this for you so that you could walk around and be foolish. Right? I had some really crazy situations in my life, like this close to suicide, like, yo, I'm out of here. And that would, that would play into my head. No matter how hard it was between me and my parents, that stuck with me. That line literally saved my life on a multitude of occasions and kept me from doing really silly, well, more silly things than I would have done. It was that sense of purpose that my, both of my parents gave me. So on the one hand, for Hannah to give Samuel away must have been a real bitter moment. Must have been a terrible moment. But on the other hand, it was a moment of, hey, kid, this is part of the fact that you are a promised child. You are a child of promise. You are going to do something. God is going to do something through you. Parents, what are we working into the minds of our children? Do they get this message? That they are children of promise. You go, well, you know, my kid didn't have some dramatic story like you. You know, I mean, I had a pretty dramatic story. You know, I was sick, I was going to die, I was going to do a tracheotomy and all this stuff. And they took me to the church, and the pastor prayed over me, and the pastor basically said, Lord, heal him or take him home. Which means, basically, if you don't heal him, he's going to die. And then they took me to the doctor the next day, and all my complications were cleared, right? So you go, listen, man. You had some crazy dramatic story. Of course your parents are going to say that about you. Well, listen, what does Malachi tell us? Malachi tells us that he brings husbands and wives together because God was desiring what? Godly offspring. Think about that. God is saying, I brought you together and you have a child. And so when God was forming that child in your womb, God is saying, okay, that's godly offspring I'm desiring. You can still give purpose to your child regardless. You know, I know people that were born and there weren't crazy dramatic situations and they're unbelievable, unbelievably used by God. Charles Haddon Spurgeon had a pretty regular life. And the dude has done more for the gospel in one day than I'll do for the rest of my entire life, right? So, look, you don't have to have some dramatic story 
to tell your child he's a child of promise. You don't have to have some dramatic story to instill a purpose and a reason for why your child is on a planet. And look, I am sure if we could talk to my mom and dad, that they would say, yeah, we would have done this, this, that, 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 and that, and that, and that differently. Right? And I'm sure if you talk to me, I could give you a list of a whole bunch of things that they could have done differently with me. But that one principle carried me through so much in life to this very day, knowing that both of my parents believed that I was going to do something for God changed everything for me. So that's my challenge to you as parents. What are, we in, what are we giving to our children? Are we purposeful about letting them know that they're children of promise, that there's a reason that they're here? Why do you think that we go after Planned Parenthood as much as we do? The little, little children of promise being, being taken off the planet. No. We're, not, we're, gonna, we're gonna give them, we're gonna give our kids the knowledge that they're here for a reason, and there will never, you see that kid over there in the plane on the, there's never going to be another person like him ever again on the face of the earth, ever. There was never anybody like him, and there will never be like, like him ever again. Well, then why is he here? I have no idea, but I can't wait to see. There's a sense of purpose. There should be a sense of excitement every day with your kid. When you're learning your children, when you're learning your children, that's what you're trying to figure out. Where, where, is, where is this kid going? You know, I'm my firstborn, you know, he's a, pretty, he's a pretty brilliant kid. He's a smart kid, very articulate, puts concepts together. I go, okay, I got an idea where this guy's going. You know, my daughter is very nurturing, very caring, got a lot of leadership in her, but at the same time, she's very compassionate. She cries for people. I laugh at people. She cries. I feel bad. Now laugh again, right? Then my, my youngest, you know, the guy has got so much fire in his belly. It's like, just calm down, man. Just chill out. He can't. He's just, Ugh! right? I got kind of ideas of where they're all going, right? So think about these things with your children. Study them. Affirm those things in your children. You know, sometimes the things that are kind of annoying are the things that God is building in them to make them who they are. You know, my mom used to say to me, she used to say, you're arguing all the time. You're always arguing with me. She's like, God's going to use that eventually. But right now, you're in trouble. And I get in trouble. That was brilliant what my mother was doing. On one hand, she had to discipline me. But on the other hand, she wasn't crushing my spirit, right? You're going to use that somehow for God. Go to your room. Right? And uh, it was funny, because today, I was, I was thinking about this. There's a video of me going back and forth with this guy in Planned Parenthood. And he and I are having an, an argument. And he ended up saying this crazy stuff, and it got shared all over the place. I'm like, man, I wish my mom was here to see this. Because <clears throat> all she got was me arguing with her. She never got to see the, uh, you know, whatever. Thinking about my mom, her birthday a couple days ago. Okay, so if you're a parent... Don't just look at your kid as having these annoying habits. Find those areas where you go, okay, man, we're going to develop that. That's going to be good, right? That's going to be good. So all this purpose is being poured into this kid, Samuel. He's been given over to the high priest as a little, little boy, right? Must have been painful, but at the same time, that must have given that kid such a sense of purpose. How many other four or five-year-olds do you think were running around with the high priest at the time? Zero. Zero. So this was giving this kid a sense of purpose. Okay, now, let's keep going. But she doesn't say in verse 28, as long as he lives, he belongs to the high priest. She says, as long as he lives, what? He belongs to the Lord. That's another thing my mom used to say to me. She used to say, I'm not worried about you because I gave you to the Lord when you were 15 or something like that. But she was always worried about me. She said, come back and curfew and blah, 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 blah. But she used to say, I'm not worried about it. I gave you to the Lord. I never even knew what that meant until I had children. By giving your child to the Lord is essentially, God, whatever you want to do with them, whatever you're going to do with them, I'm going to let them go and do with them what you want to do with them. And my role is to seek your will for them, not mine. 
for as long as they live. Everybody's like, praise God. Well, what if God says that as long as your child will live, it's 12 years. Are you good with that? I thought you lent them to the Lord. What if that means that your child says, hey, mom, dad, I want to jump on an airplane and go over to Syria. And you say, don't you understand what's happening in Syria right now? They're chopping people up, left and right. He goes, yup. What about that? Or if your child takes some crazy path and you can't control them, do you trust that God still has them? That God still has a vision for them? When she says, I am leaving my child in the hands of the Lord, that has a billion implications. You realize she had to make pilgrimage from where she was to where uh, Eli was, which means for the majority of the year, she is separated days and days by foot from this situation. She doesn't know what's happening with her kid. You think that was easy for her? You just leave your kid with somebody and you don't know what's going on with him? But see, she wasn't leaving Samuel with the priest. She was leaving Samuel with who? With God. This is one of the most difficult lessons that any parent has to learn about their children. It's one of the lessons that God told Abraham, right? Hey, Abraham, take your son, your only son, and do what? Sacrifice him. Let him go. So on the one hand, we have to love our children. On the one hand, we have to give them a sense of purpose. And then on the other hand, we have to let them go. Now here's the crazy thing. One of the things I say all the time is that God never calls us to do something that he won't do himself. Is that not true? I say it all the time. And I was thinking to myself, man, that Hannah, she's so faithful. She took her little boy and gave him away. What does John 3.16 say? God so loved the world that he what? He gave Jesus away. Here is Jesus. <clears throat> you know, the scripture says he was in the embrace of the Father. That's what the Greek says. Right? It says he was in the bosom of the Father. He was, he was, the Greek is basically like they were face to face from all eternity. And the Father takes Jesus. He says, Jesus, I got to let you go. You have to go down there. And you're not going to serve in the temple and be treated like a nice little boy. They're going to kill you. They're going to brutally murder you. So here's Hannah taking her child of promise, giving him away. And we go, wow. But there's the father taking his only son. He only had one Jesus. And gives him away for us. And when God tells you to, to, to let your children go, no matter what the danger may be, he's not calling you to do something he didn't do himself. Think about that. Okay, so as long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord there. Now, let's all stand up. I want to sing this together. <clears throat> Have your Bible, Second, 1 Samuel chapter 2. We're going to start from where she says, my heart exalts in the Lord. You guys ready? Kyle, this is your idea. Stand over here with me. We're going to do it. <laughs> All right. My, Kyle doesn't need a microphone. I need a mic. Okay. So right where it says, my heart exalts in the Lord. One, two, three. My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. For there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The rolls of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread. But those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. 
The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Good. That's memory verse. Next week, everybody's going to have all that memorized. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, Hannah bursts out in this prayer that actually ends up being a psalm, right? Uh, here, here's what's funny, right? When she was praying about her stuff and her struggle, she was moving her mouth, but no sound came out. Then God delivers her, right? And what does she do? She prays out loud in worship for everybody to hear. Very interesting. Now, watch this. What does she say? My heart exalts in Samuel. My child. Is that what the text says? No. She says, my heart exalts in the Lord. All this joy, all this happiness that she has is actually rooted in God. Now, when you exalt, it's basically a way of saying you're, you're physically expressing joy. It's one thing to feel joy, right? Exulting is when you physically express that you're happy. Now, me, I'm generally a pretty moody guy. Um, my emotions are kind of all over the place. Right? Some days I'm happy, some days I'm not, and it really, it just depends, right? Well, what does the scripture say? Fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy. It doesn't say moodiness is not a fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't say the fruit of the Spirit is love and moodiness, right? And now listen, we are in a very, very difficult time, Right? I mean that in the world, we got these, these psychopaths over there in Syria hurting people. In our country, things are crazy. In our lives, things are crazy. In our church, things are crazy. Individually, things are crazy. I get that. But we shouldn't always be moody all the time. You know, one of the challenges of the scripture is, are you going to look at what's happening in the world? Are you going to look at what's happening in your country, in your church, in your life? Are you going to look at that, or are you going to look at God? Because all of us know what to say. All of us say, that's why I'm going to look at God. Well, if I was looking at God all the time, I wouldn't be so moody all the time, to be honest with you. <clears throat> because God is never, all the problems that I have in my life, right, is God bigger than them, yes or no? Yes. Okay, then. Then I'm preaching to myself now. If I really, truly focused on God, Fort, I need some water. If I really focused on God all the time, right? Then I would not be as moody as I am. I would be happy. Now, listen, I was out there. I'm going to pick on you. I was out there yesterday, right? We we're, were doing uh, hot chocolate. We're handing out hot chocolate on Black Friday and telling people about Jesus. And I had this one friend, and every time I jumped out of the bus, because we had to make these stops, she jumped out. She was all, let's go, come on. She's happy, right? Why is she happy? No, I'm sure she's happy about the people. I'm sure she's happy about all this. But she's happy because of Jesus. Jesus is being exalted, am I right? Is it? Jesus is being exalted, right? <clears throat> She's glad that Jesus is being exalted. You know, you know, Black Friday, thank you. Black Friday is this time when everybody's just so focused on themselves, and here we are, and we're exalting the name of Jesus, and she's happy, and she's jumping around, right? Sometimes we're just too moody, man. And I am not saying, I don't want to trivialize your problems. Some of you have horrible problems, but none of them are bigger than God. So I don't want to trivialize your problems, but what I want to challenge you is, are you trivializing God? 
Because you got significant issues. I know all of you. And if I don't know you, then you really have issues. Nah. <laughs> I mean, some of you got significant issues for sure. But you got a significant God. We don't want to make our issues significant and God insignificant, right? We want to dwell so much on God that we just forget completely that we have any issues at all, right? Okay, so there she is. Now, her heart exalts in the Lord. And what does this mean? What this means is when she was sad and things weren't going good for her, where did she go? Did she go to her husband? Did she go to the, the big piece of chicken? No, she went to God. So now when things went well for her, she doesn't go, my heart exalts in my husband or my heart exalts in my kid. She goes, no, my heart exalts in God because it's always been God. When things were bad, it was God. When things are good, it's God. What's it like for us? When things are bad, we go to the other stuff. And when it's good, we go, God, right? Well, you know, it's funny to me, all these football players, you know, they always thank God when they win. Some of them won't even talk to anybody when they lose, Right? We're like that. When things are bad, it, it, we go all over the place to get us help. But when it's good, then we want to start talking about God. Or vice versa. When things are good, we don't want anything to do with God. Because we're okay. We don't need any help. But now we need all this help. Then we get all spiritual. Very few of us are centered on God in both situations. But Hannah is God-focused and God-centered in both situations. She says, my horn is exalted in the Lord. Now, <clears throat> horn in that, in that period was a symbol of your strength. Okay, so he, all the horned beasts in the mind of these people were strong animals. So when it talks about your horn is lifted up and all that, it's talking about your strength. And notice what she says. She says, my strength, my horn is exalted in the Lord. So when I say this woman Hannah is a strong woman of God, you're supposed to do that. But you're supposed to understand why she's a strong woman of God. She's exalted as a strong woman because she's in the Lord. So her strength gets identified as being in the Lord. Where is your strength coming from? You know, if we don't get this right, listen to me. This is a life and death issue. If we don't get this right, that all of our strength comes from God. All of our identity and value comes from God. If we don't get this right, we're going to have a lifetime of misery. Some of the reason that we cannot enjoy and rejoice in God is because we don't have this down. Your strength is coming from your finances. Your strength is coming from your ability to provide. Your strength is coming from what other people say about you. Your strength is coming from being accepted by a group. Your strength is coming from being accepted by certain people in a group. Your strength is coming from what your kids think about you. What your wife thinks about you. What your husband thinks about you. Da -da 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 -da. All those people have to affirm to you who you are and where your value is. If Hannah would have lived like that, she would have never made it. Because her husband was not exalting her strength. He wasn't saying she was a good woman of God. Her culture wasn't saying that. Her religious leaders weren't saying that. We have a lot to learn from this woman. She knew that she had no hope in affirming who she was as a strong woman other than in God. And so somewhere along the line, she's hearing from God, I know what the culture says about you. I know what your husband says about you. I know what the high priest said about you. High priest just called you an alcoholic. I know all that. But I am telling you, you're my daughter and you're strong. And that was enough for her. Is that really enough for you? Really? Like the entire world could be completely against you, giving you negative messaging, but you know who you are in God. Here's a challenge. Do we have enough Bible to even know who we are in God? Here's one of the things that happens. So here's Paul, right? Here's the Apostle Paul. And he's got this church. And the church, they got this financial problem. They can't figure it out. So what they do is they sue each other. So you got two Christians going to court, suing each other. And Paul looks at them and says, are y'all serious right now? 
you guys are Christians and you're going to court to sue each other? And then he says this crazy thing. He says, don't you know that the saints will judge the world? If you're to judge the world, you can't dispute between something like this. What is he saying? He's saying, you guys are going to court with each other because you don't know who you are. You don't know what your identity is. If you knew who you are, half the stuff you do, you would not do. Half the fights that you have with people are based on insecurities about your identity. 90% of the reason that we get angry at people is because they are not affirming our identity that we want from them. And Paul is saying, you guys are fighting with each other because you've forgotten that you're one day going to judge the world. You say, what does that mean? It means that we're going to judge the world. Well, how? I don't know. All I know is in Christ, that's who you are. What does it mean to be created in the image of God? You know, we say this all the time. We don't want little children murdered because they're image bearers of God. Do you know what that means? It means you're the representative of God on the earth. It means that when you walk down the street, people should say, that's what God's like. When you talk to people, people should say, oh, that's what God's like. When you, when you go to a restaurant and somebody's late with your order and you respond a certain way, your response is the way God would respond if he was in that situation. That's what it means to image God. If we were in that restaurant and we had that mindset, how would we treat each other? You know, Jesus had a lot of hecklers. He had a lot of haters. And you know, John chapter 8 one time, he was going back and forth with the Jews and the Jews said all these crazy things to him and he says, uh, I'm honoring my father, but you dishonor me. And then he says, I'm not seeking my own honor. There's one who seeks it. Meaning the father is looking to honor me. So he says, he basically said, I don't really care much about what you have to say because I know who I am. I'm Jesus. And he wasn't saying in a horrible, evil, prideful way, but what he was saying was, nothing you can say can destabilize me and take me away from who I am. I know that I'm here on the earth with you, just walking around, but I'm not just some regular person. What does the scripture say? In Christ, we're not just regular people walking around. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when Paul is arguing with the Corinthians, he says, when you guys are arguing with each other, aren't you acting like mere men, just like regular people? Catch that. He said, you're acting like regular people. Why? That's an identity issue. He says, we're Christians. You're not a regular person. You know, at some point, you know, I had a friend one time, and he goes, you know, we're going through this stuff. And he says, who are we really? And that's how, okay, now he's starting to get it. Who you are in Christ is unbelievable. If you really sat down, I would challenge you. Go through the New Testament and see what it says about what it means to be in Christ. I'm just going to throw a couple things. Hebrews 10 says that you're perfect in Christ. Ephesians 2 says that you are seated with God, with Christ in the heavenly realms. It says that all spiritual blessings are yours. 2 Corinthians says that whatever promise God has made finds their yes in Jesus. And you are in Jesus. There's so many benefits to being in Christ. Philippians, you are a citizen of heaven. If you truly, really knew that, Nothing could destabilize you. She says, my horn is exalted in the Lord. Which is the same thing as saying in Christ. All my strength comes from in Christ. It was crazy to me <clears throat> as I was listening to Heather talk about her, her poem because she was talking about her weakness, you know. And I said, this goes perfectly with the sermon. Ah. Right? Because, because she's talking about her weakness, but then she's talking about God and his strength. Right? How many of us go and talk about our weaknesses out in public? You know, you know we, we kind of have this thing every Sunday. We have confession where we sit down and we talk about where we struggle. Not many people talk during that time. 
And there's a million reasons why that could be, but one of the most obvious reasons is I don't want to go around a bunch of religious people and tell them I had a horrible week. You don't want to talk about your weaknesses. But listen, when you know who you are in Christ, you can stand up in front of a bunch of people and feel like you want to throw up and still do it. Because you know who you are. Hannah knew who she was from the beginning. She knew who she was before Samuel came around. See, that's the thing. She wasn't, all of her identity wasn't poured into being Samuel's mother. She was who she was before she got Samuel. You know, all of us, we have this thing where it's like, man, if I had this, if I had this, then I would be happy, then I would be whatever. And then all of your identity gets subsumed into that thing or that concept or that person or that child. You know, I used to play baseball a lot. I used to live in Florida. And you wouldn't your parents are crazy. Crazy parents. Why? Because all their value is into that kid. And they want to see that kid be so successful. And they yell and scream at the kid because they want the kid to be successful. I, mean, I just love you, Johnny. No, you don't love Johnny. You love you. And you're living through Johnny because you poured all your identity into him. Here's the thing. If you pour your strength and your identity in anybody else but the Lord, you will destroy that other person. You will eat them alive because they cannot bear the weight of your soul. They will not be able to live up to your standards and then you will cannibalize them. They will not be able to do all the things that you want them to do. They will not be able to affirm you as much as you want to be affirmed. And then you will destroy them because you will be so angry at them for not fulfilling you in the way that you want to be fulfilled. Hannah learned that story. So she's like, I'm not doing that to Samuel. Not doing it to my husband. I don't really care. Not doing it to the priest. I got God. All my strength is exalted in the Lord. Let's keep going. My mouth derides my enemies. Now watch this. Remember, who was her enemy? So her husband had married this woman, Penina. Penina had a bunch of children. So Penina used to mock her all the time. Right? That was one enemy. And we can guess from their culture that in their culture she would have been a mocked woman because she was barren. Right? She says, my mouth derides my enemies. And you go, man, Andrew, I thought this girl was some spiritual, spiritual giant. You hyped her up to be the spiritual giant. Well, she's mocking people now. Well, wait a second. How is she deriding her enemies? To deride your enemy basically means, I beat you. That's what it means. Well, how is she saying that she beat her enemies? Watch this. Because I rejoice in your salvation. She does not mock her enemies by saying, Ha! I have a kid now. Ha! I'm right, you're wrong. She doesn't do that. She doesn't even talk about them. What she does is, she rejoices in the Lord. She rejoices in God's salvation. She enters into worship. Why? Here's why. The aim of her enemies was to bring her down. Is that not true? You, you know, you, you have people in your life that they just wake up and they just want to bring you down. And, and Hannah is saying, you, Penina, you, society, you tried to bring me down. How does she overcome that? By bringing them down? Isn't that usually how we go? That's how I go. You know, I'm from the hood. Somebody comes after you, you're going to give it back to them. Somebody says something to you, you're going to say something back to them. But what does she do? She doesn't say anything to them. What she says is, hey, you're trying to bring me down. I'm not going to bring you down. What am I going to do? I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. The way you overcome your enemies is not by overcoming them and fighting them back and fighting fire with fire. No. <clears throat> you overcome your enemies by what? Rejoicing in the salvation of God. And so many of us are so built on defending ourselves all the time. Somebody comes after you, you want to defend yourself. Somebody says something, you want to defend yourself. Somebody's trying to bring you down, you're going to defend yourself. Hannah doesn't do that. What she says is, the way I'm going to overcome is by rejoicing in God. Let me explain something to you. 
You will go into a circle of failure if you get into this tit for tat with people in your life who are trying to bring you down. Because the minute you go to bring them down, what are they going to do to you? Well, they're going to call you a hypocrite, which is designed to bring you back down, right? So they're going to fight you back and bring you down. You go, oh, you're trying to bring me down. Then what are you going to do? You're going to try to bring them down. Well, then now, excellent. Now you're, now you're stuck in a circle of all, everybody trying to tear each other down. How do you overcome that? She goes, I'm not even looking at you. Panina, with your 19 kids, good for you. I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm getting out of that circle where you're trying to bring me down, and I'm going to go worship God. And hopefully, you can see and join me. That's how you get back at people. That's how you overcome as a Christian. You don't overcome as a Christian by fighting fire with fire. You overcome by going to worship the Lord. And listen, let me spiritualize this. Some of you got demonic oppression, demons coming after you. And you know what? There's some times where you have to like confront demons in spiritual warfare. We talked about that on stage a couple weeks ago. But you know what? Do you know when we got the most reaction when we were in the middle of our whole fighting with the demon was when we started praying and worshiping. Is that not true? I opened the scripture and we just, start, we just started reading about all the excellencies of Jesus and that thing went crazy on us. So there's a hint for you in spiritual warfare too. Turn on some worship music. Stop sitting there and, and moping and feeling sorry for yourself. Listen to some worship. Open your Bible. Pray and listen to some worship. That's how you're going to overcome. So if it's somebody at work, if it's somebody in your family, if it's some crazy demon, whatever it is, they're all going to fall under this. Because the very reason that God has allowed that trial and in in, in that assignment into your life is because he wants it to result in worship. Remember we read this. Year after year, when they would go up, this girl had to deal with this every single year. He said, why? Because God's like, when I finally deliver her, she's going to have the most intense worship session ever. How do you think she was saying this when she was saying this after all those years? Joy. Yeah, one, of the, one of the phrases, it's not a good phrase, but it says, you know, it says you should never rate, waste a crisis. Do not waste your crisis. So when you're in those situations, be wise. But here, so, here's, so here's Hannah. She says, my mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Because I'm rejoicing in you, God, that's how I overcome my enemies. Verse 2. There is none holy like the Lord, and there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge and by him actions are weighed. Look what she says. She doesn't say, hey, now I got a kid. Ha ha. No, she's continuing the theme. There's none holy like the Lord. She's focusing on the holiness of God. You say, Hannah. You didn't have you, you had all these years where you had no children. Your husband had this other wife in this crazy culture. Who cares about the holiness of God? Focus on you. What is the first request in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, what? Hallowed be your name. Which basically translates to holify your name. She was concerned, first and foremost, with the holiness of God. And if you think about the culture she was in, it makes complete and perfect sense. She was in a culture that had no respect in any way, shape, or form about the holiness of God. And let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Here we are talking about how horrible it was that she had to go year after year with no child, and she was getting mocked and all this, and we felt so sad for her. I remember last week, everybody was sad for Hannah. I just described a whole nation of people who cared nothing for the holiness of God. Is it a bigger crime to you this week 
that somebody cut you off in traffic, or said something sarcastic to you at work, or your husband said, did some horrible thing to you, is that a bigger crime to you than the fact that you live in a nation that cares nothing about the holiness of God? See, our personal issues are our number one issues. What's the last thing you've been angry about? What's the last thing you've shed tears over? Have you, uh, seriously, seriously, have you ever said, have you ever left the room and be like, yo, I'm so angry, I got to get myself out of this situation? I've been in that situation. But has it ever been, have you ever been so angry that the holiness of God is insulted that you had to leave a room? Have you ever been so heartbroken that the holiness of God is ignored that you had to lock yourself in your room and cry your eyes out? See, we cry when stuff affects us. We're angry when stuff affects us. But the holiness of God, we go, ah. I mean, think about what happened yesterday. I was watching this Facebook thing, and it was showing all these people fighting over these Xboxes on Black Friday, punching each other out and all that stuff, right? And I'm laughing. I was like, look at this. This is a big joke on Facebook. Ha! And the Lord was like, well, wait a second. Think about what is happening. We're not even 24 hours removed from Thanksgiving. Thanking God for all the good things that he's done for us, right? We're not even 24 hours removed from that, and there we are fighting like animals over this electronic device. And I thought that that was funny. Ha, 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 ha. None of us has an understanding, really, of the holiness of God. And we don't understand how much of a crime it is that God's holiness is violated in our nation on a daily basis. In our city on a daily basis. To Hannah, she was concerned about the holiness of God. When she says, hey, I know who I am in God, she says, by the way, let me tell you about who this God is that I'm in. The God that I worship, there's none holy like Him. Meaning, there's no being in the entire universe that is like God. Like the God that I'm worshiping. This God that I said, I'm rejoicing in Him. I'm exulting in Him. I'm rejoicing in His salvation. This is who He is. There is no being in the universe like Him. So what does it mean when we say that people are dishonoring the holiness of God, what we're saying is people are looking at God and going, eh, Xbox is more important than you, relationship is more important than you, money is more important than you, fill in the blank, more important than you. And Hannah's saying, no. Husband, society, Samuel, there is nobody like the Lord. Nobody holy like the Lord. There is no rock like our God. See, one of the things that helps you when you understand the holiness of God, if there's nobody like Him, then when you go to Him for refuge, when you go to Him to rescue you, there is nobody that will rescue you like God will rescue. There's nobody that will keep you stable like God will keep you stable. You know, Hannah had a lot of storms in her life. And she's like, okay, let me try to stand on my husband. He'll, he'll, he'll keep me up. Wrong. Let me stand on my high priest. He'll keep me up. Wrong. Let me go to my friends in my society. He'll keep you up. They're gossiping about you, Hannah. They're not keeping you up. Nothing. She says, there's no rock like our God. She had been through that over and over and over again. And God had been the only one who had proved faithful 100% of the time. So you see the connection between the holiness of God and your need for stability. Here's the connection. There's nobody like Him. So when you run to Him, you're not going to get any other stability other than in Him. You're never going to find a substitute God because there's nobody like Him. As much as you go out and try to find a substitute, good luck. There's nobody like Him. You only get one. To recognize the holiness of God. There's no one besides you. And she goes, talk no, no, no more so proudly. Now she's talking directly to the people who are mocking her. What is she going to say to them? 
Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. This woman is incredible. So we already saw that she's not going to fight fire with fire. She's not going to fight back at the, at the people who are mocking her. She's going to rejoice in the Lord. Then she shows us the holiness of God. And now, what is she doing with the people who are mocking her? She's discipling them. This is amazing. You disciple your enemies? You know what we say? We say, love your enemies, right? That's what we say. Love them. Okay, love is good, but what does that mean? Here's what it means. When your enemy is sinning against you, when you speak to them, are you out to defend yourself or are you out to bring them closer to God? Look what she says. The Lord is a God of knowledge and by Him actions are weighed. So stop speaking so proud. Stop being so arrogant. She's warning them. She's concerned about their relationship with God. This woman is amazing. Hannah, you're, you're worried about their relationship with God. You're telling them, you're discipling them, you're teaching them to not be, not be full of pride and not be so arrogant. You're warning them that God is a God of knowledge. What does she mean when she says God is a God of knowledge? What she's saying is, listen, Panina, God knows that I have not sinned, which was making me a barren woman, and you're not necessarily righteous, which is giving you children. So stop going off at the mouth, Panina. You're arrogant right now. No matter what our culture says, because their culture had said that she was wrong and that Penina was right. That's what their culture was telling them. And she's saying, God is a God of knowledge. Forget what our culture says. He's weighing your actions. Test and see if this is the right thing that you're doing. You know, God, God is still weighing our actions, you know. Most of us believe that God's going to weigh our actions on the day of judgment. He's weighing our actions every day. And he tells you, that word, not good. That action, not good. He's weighing our actions and she is discipling this woman. Stop talking so proudly. Let arrogance not come from your lips. What does Jesus say? Out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. She is concerned with what's coming out of Penina's mouth because she is concerned for her heart condition. When people are coming after you unfairly, are you concerned about their heart? I have to deal with this every week. We're at Planned Parenthood, right? I was in a situation and, and uh, I lost my temper with a guy. I didn't yell at him. I didn't do anything crazy. But I, I lost my temper with the guy who was in the flesh. And somebody came up to me afterward and was like, he's still an image bearer of God, you know. Even though he's about to go and, and have his son aborted, he's still an image bearer of God himself. How is your heart to this guy right now? When you're justifiably angry at a person, is your main concern about them, man, they said that to me, their heart with God must not be right. Or is it, how can they say that to me? You said that to me? They said that to me. I have the right to be angry. Did Penina have the right to be angry? Hannah, did Hannah have the right to be angry? Yes. You came in here, you married my husband, you got all these kids, now you're making fun of me, she's got the right to be angry. Yes, she does. But here she is concerned about the heart condition of her enemy. You know, when the scripture says, love your enemy, this is what it looks like. You know, love your enemy has to have feet on it. It's got to have some actual ramifications in your life. It can't just be, well, the Bible says, love your enemies, so I love you. I hate your guts, but I love you. Can't stand you, but I love you. Can't do that. It's like what Jeremy did. Jeremy went up there and prayed for these people. Here's my challenge to you. Uh, let, let's, let's wrap up. Ooh, we got a lot of stuff to do. Here's my challenge to you. Where is your identity and your value located in really? 
please don't give me or yourself the silly Christianese answer. Honestly, in your heart of hearts, where is your identity and your strength and your value located in? Number one. Find some scriptures this week that tell you who you are in Christ and pray over them because you have no idea what they mean. Yes, yeah, so and you're seated in the heavenly realms. What does that mean, you're seated in the heavenly realms? I don't know what that means. Think about that. You're created in the image of God. You're being conformed to the image of Christ. What does that mean, you're being conformed to the image of Christ? Hebrews 10 says that you are perfected in Christ. What does that mean? Open your Bible this week and find those passages that tell you who you are in Jesus, number one. Number two, dwell on the holiness of God. Dwell on the holiness of God. So Isaiah chapter 6 is, is, a, is an easy one, right? Go to Isaiah chapter 6. Read the book of Revelation, starting around verse 5, where John goes up into heaven. He sees all creation worshiping God, right? Dwell on the holiness of God. Ask God to give you some emotion, some loyalty, some allegiance to the holiness of God instead of all your emotions being wasted on yourself. Oh, I said that. I did. Now listen to me. I'm not saying it's bad to feel angry and sad for yourself. What I'm saying is all of it, if all of it is about you, we have a problem. God did not give you tear ducts so you could cry about yourself all the time. You know, the scripture says Jesus was a man of sorrows. Jesus cried a lot. And very rarely was it because he was crying for himself. And Jesus got angry. You know, he took a whip and he, and he you know, he beat people up. He got angry. I was talking to a guy one time. He said, well, Jesus wouldn't do that. I said, well, it's right there. He did it twice. Well, he didn't really do it. Okay. God didn't give you your anger to waste it on yourself all the time. Dwell on the holiness of God. And finally, find an enemy that you can actually love and pray for and disciple this week. Love your enemies by discipling them. So at work, or in your house, or whatever it is, whoever has made themselves your enemy, your job this week is to find a way to disciple them. We've got to follow our sister Hannah here. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for the example of Hannah, God. Thank you for mothers who give a sense of purpose and direction to their children. God, help us to be moms and dads and disciples who do that. God, show us who we are in you. God, show us who you are. And God, give us the strength because of that to love our enemies by teaching them your ways. In Jesus' name, amen.